You are listening to Killer. This is case number 14, Paul John Knowles. Lock your doors, bolt your windows, and turn off the lights. We're about to begin. Paul John Knowles was born in Florida on April 17, 1946. Knowles was put into foster care at a young age by his father. He was a troubled child who did not respect authority, and he was the type of child who refused to do his homework, and at one point he punched a girl in the face for rejecting his advances. Knowles was incarcerated for the first time at the age of 19 for kidnapping a police officer. Over the next several years, Knowles was in and out of prison. It was during this time at a stint at Rayford Penitentiary located in Stark, Florida, where he began a pen pal relationship with Angela Kovic. Kovic was never pers- or had never personally met Knowles and lived in San Francisco. The interesting thing with Kovic is that while never having met him, she hired an attorney that helped to win Knowles' parole following the acceptance of a marriage proposal. In May of that year, he was out of jail and flew to her home via a ticket purchased by Kovic with intent to marry her. Kovic only needed one look at Knowles and felt an aura of fear that terrified her. She immediately decided she would not marry him. We've also read another report that stated Kovic had sought the advice of a psychic and was warned of a new dangerous man in her life. Either way, Kovic called it off and Knowles was on his own. Knowles claimed he went on a murderous rampage following the breakup and killed three people on the streets of San Francisco the night their relationship was ended. Ultimately, he landed back in Jacksonville, Florida where he quickly landed back in jail for a bar fight, where he stabbed a bouncer. Knowles managed to pick the lock of his detention cell and slipped away on July 26, 1974. That's your birthday, right? I don't know about the year, but that's the day, right? Yeah, (laughs) that is the day. So everybody out there knows exactly how old I am now. Hey, nailed it. Craig's 100. (laughs) (laughs) On this date in history, John Knowles picked the lock to his cell and Craig popped out of the womb. <laughs> and boom, like a fetus, knowledge was born. <laughs> Some NWA lyrics for you guys. Anyway, um, yeah, this dude was, uh, he was quite the uh, maniac early on. Uh, so when I was researching about him, there's not like tons and tons of info on this case. It's just there's a lot of just ra- <laughs> rampage. And so it's kind of quick, boom, 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 through this case. But uh, what I found fascinating was, you know, obviously, like, he was in foster care early on and then was just, like, a complete troublemaker his whole life. And then, like, he dude goes to jail and picks his own lock and gets out. Like, I just, like, he is, uh, he's, like, on a mission, as you find out through the story, if you've not heard it, um, you know, to just keep going on from one thing to the next. And, you know, it's just, it's crazy. And what's even weirder is, you know, we opened with it, this... Kovic agreed to marry him and then, you know, flies, like, like pays money for his uh, legal fees to get him out of jail. Like, she is probably, like, the main reason this guy turns into a complete psychopath. Yeah, no kidding. And just to follow that up, would you, are you the type of person that would buy a car without even looking at it or taking it for a test drive? Hell no. I, uh, when I was buying my house that we moved into 2017, I was telling my realtor, You spend more time test driving a car than you do walking through the house that you're going to live in to buy. But that being said, and being aware of that, we came back through this house several times because I wanted to be sure. I mean, you're spending a substantial amount of your money on a place to live. I wanted it to be the right place. So we made sure to do a couple walkthroughs for that reason, you know. But like the way that 
typically you buy a house anymore and the markets are pretty hot. So it's like, if you don't buy it right then, it's like that pressure, right? You got to buy it right then. And, uh, you know, this is kind of strange. Like you're saying, like you're alluding to here, would you buy a car without test driving it? This dude, I mean, how do you find it? find a prisoner <laughs> like yeah how do you you know how do you agree to marry someone this you're in a pen pal relationship with writing letters that you've never met face to face and ter- and they're in prison <laughs> yeah <laughs> like it's not just a random pen pal it's a pen pal from prison so like you've already <laughs> in my book you've already got three strikes against you and i'm out <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't understand where this comes from this is quite uh insane on the part of this woman but uh yeah let's continue on Knowles, who just escaped from his jail cell, was on the lookout for some money and a car. He broke into the home of 65-year-old Alice Curtis. Knowles bound and gagged her while he ransacked her home, and she later died from choking on her dentures due to the gag. She was his first confirmed victim. Knowles took her yellow 1971 Dodge Demon and took off. A week later, police were hot on the heels of Knowles. They connected him to the murder of Alice and to the theft of her car. He decided it was time to dump her car. While at the location where he was getting ready to dump the car, he noticed two family acquaintances, Lillian and Milette Anderson. Knowles was afraid that the pair would identify him and alert someone of his presence, so he kidnapped them, strangled them, and buried their bodies in a nearby swamp. According to the Charlie Project, the sisters' remains still have never been found, and the case is linked to Knowles from a recording of him admitting to killing two girls matching their descriptions. However, conflicting reports state the bodies were in fact found. The tragedy in the girls' murders is that their mother left them home alone at 6 p.m. that night in order to go care for a sick relative. Their father was due to be home at 6 p.m., but was running late and arrived home an hour later. It was within this hour the girls were kidnapped and murdered. Shortly after their murder, he murdered a teenage girl who was walking home. Ima Jean Sanders, age 13. Ima had run away from Beaumont, Texas in July 1974 to be with her mother in Warner Robins, Georgia. She disappeared on August 1, 1974. August 2nd in Atlantic Beach, Florida, Knowles broke into the home of Marjorie Howie, age 49. It was not clear if he broke in or was invited in. However, he strangled her with a nylon stocking and stole her television set. It's alleged that he gave the TV to a former girlfriend, but that's not something I can confirm. One report claims that Knowles raped and strangled a teenage runaway following the murder of Howie. But again, reports are sparse and hard to confirm this. On August 23rd, he appeared in Musella, Georgia. He forced his way into the home of Kathy Sue Pierce. She was home with her three-year-old son. Knowles strangled Pierce, but left the child alone. On September 3rd, he had traveled all the way to Lima, Ohio. Knowles entered a pub, Scott's Inn, and met William Bates. Bates was a 32-year-old account executive for Ohio Power Company. Knowles later murdered Bates, stole his car, money, and credit cards. Bates' body was, wasn't discovered until October. He was reportedly naked and his body was found in the woods. Knowles took Bates' car to a campground in Eli, Nevada. It was September 18, 1974, when he approached two elderly campers, Emmett and Lois Johnson. Knowles bound and shot the couple. No one knew what had happened to them, and if it weren't for a confession from Knowles later on, their killer would still remain unknown to this day. On September 21, 1974, he continued the killing sprees. At this time, Knowles was in Sedgwin, Texas. It was in Sedgwin where Knowles approached a stranded motorcyclist, Charlene Hicks. Knowles abducted and raped her prior to strangling her with her own pantyhose. Next, he proceeded to drag her body through a barbed wire fence, where she was found four days later. So Knowles just like goes on a complete and utter rampage once he gets back to Florida after uh, Kovic uh, rejects him. And, you know, as you can see, there's a huge trail of bodies already. You know, there's some cases we'll talk about where, like, you know, it's a big deal and there was only, like, four or five murders, right? And listen to me now in today's present tense saying only four or five murders. Um due to the nature of a lot of the mass killings that happen anymore. Um, Four people doesn't sound like many, even though it's one is a tragedy, you know. And so it's just this guy, I mean, he just, he's all over the place, just murdering small kids, teenagers, you know, just, I think Lillian and Milette Anderson, Lillian was 11 and Milette was 7. And, you know, just because they may have possibly been able to ID him, he goes and takes them out. Like, how crazy is that? And when you say all over the place, he is literally all over the place. I'm trying to go back through this and read all the locations that we just listed off. I mean, it's 
Beaumont, Texas. It's Warner Robins, Georgia. It's Atlantic Beach, Florida. Then we jump all the way up to Lima, Ohio. Then back out to Nevada. Then back to Texas. I'm like, this is all within the course of what? Like six weeks? That's a serious <laughs> road trip. Yeah. I mean, I, I was like wondering, where's he getting all of his gas money from? <laughs> you know, and like, you know, he's not like he has a job. He's out stealing shit and then like driving around. But it's it's just crazy. Like how many places this guy goes in such a short amount of time. I mean, I barely leave my house in a week. And this guy's been to like six states, right. <laughs> you know? Well, he did, he did kill that account executive in Ohio. And it did say it, he stole his cards, his credit cards and his money in his car. And, yeah. and it, we've alluded to this. I don't remember what episode it was, but back in the seventies, the credit card transactions were the old brick carbon copy. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Yep. Who's going to track that? That guy could have went anywhere and just, been using a random credit card that he stole from that guy and that's true yeah like the uh the digital paper trail isn't as thick as it usually is now and so it's like he probably had a good week or two lead on getting that card shut off well and police probably left you know probably told the family don't cancel the credit card so they could try and trace where it was being used in case that because that guy's body wasn't found right away you know it wasn't found until october and this happened early september so they probably said, don't cancel the card. So if it's used, we can find out where it's being used at and trace this, you know. At least I would hope that's what they would do. You know, I wouldn't just cancel it right away. I wonder what the turnaround time was on transactions like that when they used to use that carbon copy method until they actually turned in the receipts and things were processed on the, the credit card company side. I wonder what the turnaround time was for that. It's instantaneous now. Yeah, instantaneous with the caveat of three to five business days. <laughs> it's, it's like when you unsubscribe from email. Oh, we'll unsubscribe you from our list in seven to ten business days. Well, that's funny because you instantly subscribed me when I clicked the next button on your web page, but it takes you ten days <laughs> to remove me. That makes no sense. Oh, yeah, that's that's um, that, that's true. That's typical. Even if you buy something at the store, somehow they can magically take the money out of your bank account at that exact second, but when you return it, it's something you don't like. Oh, wait, we can't give your money back for three to five days. <laughs> I know. That's what I don't understand. Uh, to get off here on this side tangent, but, man, like, how frustrating is it when you go to, like, like you said, like, you make a return, and it's like, oh, yeah, we'll give you your money back in a week. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You literally took it out of my account the second that you swiped my card, but it takes you seven days in this digital world to put it back into my bank account? That's bogus. Yeah. <laughs> Unless there's a good reason. If any of you know why that, that's the case, aside from who knows what, trying to gain interest on your money or something, I don't know. Let me know because that seriously just baffles me sometimes how long it takes to get your money back on something. That's exactly what it is. It's the I think that they hold your money for three to five days for that interest. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, if it's 30, 40 bucks for three to five days, it's not a lot for one person, right? That in- yeah. interest-wise, but when you're talking hundreds of thousands of people, they're probably, it, it's hard to say what kind of revenue that generates just by putting you on hold for three to five days. Oh, I know. I guarantee you that thing goes into some weird account. They invest it, try and make a bunch of money on it real quick to offset the costs that it costs them to refund you, to take back defective goods, to you know deal with people who do fraudulent things. Like, yeah, I mean... I don't know. Maybe they don't put it in an account. Maybe for some reason there's a real reason why it only why it takes three to five days to get your money back. But some places seem to be able to do it right away. Some places don't. I know Amazon, every time I buy something to return it, as soon as I print the shipping label and it gets scanned, the funds are back in my account. As soon as the shipping label is scanned at the UPS store or wherever you drop it off. Oh, dude, huh? are you nuts? You don't go to the UPS store. You pick UPS pickup and they come to your front door and you hand them the box, and they do the label and everything, and then they just take it. I never even have to walk outside. <laughs> UPS store's not far <laughs> from my house. I always just drop it off. Tell them print me a receipt. It's not far from me either, but uh, I'm extremely lazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I I work from home. I have a gym in my basement so that I don't have to leave my house. Um, I don't go anywhere, and yeah, so I'm always home all the time. I never go anywhere. <laughs> I just literally stay at my house. Uh, like probably some some weeks I don't leave the house at all. I might leave like twice a week to go somewhere a little, like maybe the grocery store. 
I do like to go to the grocery store. But anyway, I digress. Back to some true crime. Knowles met a woman on his way to Birmingham, Alabama, a beautician named Ann Dawson. Their encounter occurred on September 23, 1974. No one is certain of their relationship status, but they traveled together for six days. She paid the bills while they traveled together, but he ended up killing her on September 29th. Her body was never recovered, but Knowles later admitted to dumping it in the Mississippi River. Knowles continued on his way to Marlboro, Connecticut. By this time, it was the middle of October. He entered the home of Karen Wine and her 16-year-old daughter, Dawn, on October 16th. He bound and raped them and ultimately killed them both using a nylon stocking. Nothing major was found to be stolen other than a tape recorder. On October 18th, Knowles was in Woodford, Virginia, where he proceeded to break into the home of 53-year-old Doris Hosey. He shot her with her husband's rifle, wiped his prints off the gun, and placed it beside her body. The police were baffled by this one, as they could not find any signs of a robbery or motive. Knowles, now in Key West, Florida, and still driving Bates' stolen car, picked up two hitchhikers. He had plans to kill the pair, however, he was stopped by a policeman for a traffic violation. The officer did not know that Knowles was responsible for several murders and currently still on his murder spree. He was let go with a warning. Knowles dropped off the hitchhikers in Miami as he was a bit shaken from the encounter. He contacted his lawyer shortly after but rejected his lawyer's advice to turn himself in. He did arrange a meeting where Knowles handed him a taped confession, but shortly after he disappeared before police could track him down. Do you think that he used that tape recorder that we mentioned earlier? Because I couldn't find a connection specifically, but I'm wondering if he used that tape recorder that he jacked for this confession tape. Oh, I'm sure he did. He was he was on a feverish run, so I'm sure that's what that's exactly what he did. Yeah, he had to, right? Like where else are you coming up with this tape taped confession? So it's just kind of interesting the way these things kind of play out, you know, like he goes in this home and steals a tape recorder, seems kind of random, and then he uses it to make a tape and turn it in. Like, I don't know, it's just bizarre. Yeah, well, the, the bizarre part for me is he, he makes a taped confession, meets up with his lawyer, and then just vanishes again. I mean, granted, his lawyer's not going to arrest him, but yeah, I guess if it's client, you know, whatever, it's client privilege not to disclose anything on your client, so I, I, I don't know. To me, if I'm a lawyer, I, I would be hard-pressed not to say, hey, tip off the cops with an anonymous message and say, I'm going to be at this. So-and-so is going to be here at this place, this time. If you just so happen to want to be there to pick them up, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It would be kind of interesting how that would work out. You know, I don't know. I don't know if you, I don't know how, how you can get away with that as an attorney, because, you know, if Knowles said he was like literally the only person that he contacted and somehow the police get tipped off, like it's he, he said, he said, you know, but, it'd be interesting to see how that would play out in court. Like, well, did you arrest him lawfully or did my lawyer break, you know, attorney client privilege? (laughs) And then that would be interesting to see how that would work out. I don't honestly know, but yeah, I mean, to your point, like there's, there's lawyers who defend murderers all the time and you get details of things and they're nuts. And they're saying this guy's guilty. They have to defend him. So it's, you know, they can't really turn around and say like, Oh yeah, this guy did it. You know, he's guilty. Yeah. I guess that's, I wouldn't say it's a perk of being a lawyer, but it all, I mean, it, to me, it implies that you're complicit in some cases, but I guess they get a pass because they're representing the person. Yeah. I mean, because if you, if for every person that was guilty of a crime, like you could never talk to a lawyer and you really do want them to talk to a lawyer because you want them to go through the criminal justice system in order to get convicted if they did do something wrong, even though that guy's job's to defend them, you know, at least they go through the system people would be a lot more hesitant to go into the system if their attorneys were turning them in because they thought they were murderers, you know? It'd be a lot more difficult. I guess that's why I never wanted to be a lawyer. The whole thing is just too confusing to me. <laughs> no kidding. My tiny brain can't comprehend the uh, the legal system. Yeah, same here. Plus, plus, it was a whole shitload more college than I already wanted to do, so... <laughs> I barely did the amount of college I had to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just enough to get by. Just passing Uh, through. That's right. On November 6th, Knowles was now in Milledgeville, Georgia. He befriended befriended Carswell Carr and was invited back to Carr's place to stay the night. While having some drinks, he stabbed Carr to death and then strangled Carr's 15-year-old daughter. After the murder of the daughter, he attempted to have sex with her dead body, but he was unsuccessful. On November 8th, Knowles met British journalist Sandy Fox while in Atlanta. He impressed her with his good looks, which was a cross between Robert Redford and Ryan O'Neill, 
I took that right off the internet, and I have no idea who those guys are. Craig, you're old. You know them? Oh, you have to know who Robert Redford is. I probably I know the name. I don't remember yeah. what he looks like. Isn't he the dude that's got the the uh, salad dressing? I don't know. I, I know who they are, <laughs> but I can't. Sit. I would have to sit here and Google up some <laughs> did you, movies. Did you just tell me that I had to know who he is, and then you don't know? <laughs> yeah. I, I know, I know yeah, the name. Right. Ryan O'Neill I'm not familiar with, but I know Robert Redford. I just looked up Robert Redford, and I honestly don't think I've ever seen this man in my entire life. But he has red hair. That's all I know. And uh, Ryan O'Neill, never seen this dude either. Okay. Yeah. My keyboard clicks in here. I think he was in The Color of Money, but don't quote me on that. Come on, Google. No, oh, apparently he wasn't. See? I, I don't know Robert Redford all that well. Yeah. Yeah, see? I knew you didn't know what you are talking about. I know who he is. I just didn't know what movies he was tied to. He's, he's been around forever. <laughs> yeah, he looks pretty old when I just Google him and searched him. And uh, yeah, I uh, I don't really know either of those two people, but one has red hair and one does not. So <laughs> <laughs> take that for what it's worth. Anyway, continue. Oh, go ahead. Holy Christ, I'm, I'm, I'm just awful. I'm confusing him with Paul Newman. Paul Newman was in The Color of Money with Tom Cruise. So I, I'm an, I digress. I am an idiot. Don't listen to me about movie stars. Yeah, I was going to, uh, I was going to say, um, I was drawing a blank, but yeah, it's Newman's Own, that whole brand. That's what you're talking about, the salad dressing. You know, they got Newman's Own, and then Paul Newman has like a million different foods. They're pretty good. Have you ever had Newman's Own stuff? No, I haven't. I just knew it was there. Yeah, I've had some, uh, some different Newman variety foods, and, uh, they're pretty good. Um, they had Newman O's. Have you ever had those? Those are Oreos, Paul Newman Oreos. <laughs> I, I wouldn't defy the Oreo them. name with anything other than the original Oreo, double stuffed. Yeah, you don't want to cheat on the uh, chemically altered and dependent state of these highly processed cookies, right? That's right. Got to keep myself regular. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the Chinese buffet is for. <laughs> and, and ironic that you mentioned that, but I got Chinese carryout yesterday, so. I'm not surprised. <laughs> That was like your go-to at work. <laughs> yeah, except the Chinese carryout where I live is honestly ten times better than the the shit from where we used to work. Well, yeah, it was the most random place in the world for a Chinese restaurant to exist, so I can't imagine that it was on the up and up in terms of the health department. So okay, since you brought that up, real real quick here, I we got to get the listeners' opinion, and maybe we can put this out on Instagram as a question. But have you ever been to a Chinese? buffet slash takeout place that has a candlelit altar in the back of the kitchen Be <laughs> because this place i shit you not I, I think you've seen it too and i'm willing to go there and get a picture of it but it is there at this place <laughs> i don't think i've seen this. you didn't see it no the running joke for that place was have you ever noticed there's there's no stray cats in this town number one number two it honestly looks like this Chinese carryout place has an altar of sacrifice in the back of the kitchen. So that explains <laughs> where the cats are going. Oh. Well, they must have put them in the ice cream machine because that thing never worked either. So they probably stored their frozen cat bodies in the ice cream maker out there in the ki in the uh, main dining area after they took them to sacrifice <laughs> during off hours. All that fur was uh, clogging up the ice cream strainer. I thought my vanilla was a little hairy the one day it worked, but... I'm not going to say anything about that comment. Jesus Christ, that just sounded wrong. <laughs> and we're pissing off everybody right now, too, so we should probably keep moving on, because if there are any cat lovers out there, they're probably going to stop listening cause <laughs> due to what we just said. <laughs> hey, I'll just go on the record. I like cats. I'm a cat guy. I just, I actually had to get rid of our cat, which was like horrible because my kid was allergic to her. So for the record, let the record show David is in favor of cats. I, Craig, I'm, I'm forced to be in favor of cats. We have two cats. Each of my kids have their own cat. So I'm not a cat hater. Do they have good names at least? No, not really. I was hoping you named them like Beavis and Butthead or something. I honestly could have because one's a black tiger cat and one's a yellow tiger cat. It would have been perfect. All right, small. Two, I have two small personal stories. You know, everyone loves the personal story hour on the show, right? All right, so personal story number one. My brother-in-law, he's 
in school still and plays basketball. One of the kids he plays basketball with, I shit you not, looks like real life butthead. His eyes are super duper squinty. He's got this like puffy, froey hair almost, you know? So it kind of like goes up high, kind of like butthead's hair. It's brown. He's real skinny. And he just has that like look. He he almost looks like if Beavis and Butthead kind of melted together into one person. He like looks just like them combined. It's the weirdest thing. Personal story number two, which is probably the better of the two stories. My best friend's aunt is a lesbian, and she has two cats. One's name is Dill, and the other's name is Doe. Oof. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> the thing that the things those cats have seen. <laughs> she's seriously the best but that i mean i went <laughs> he moved away out of state and he came back and he was staying with her and i went over to see him and i saw the cats and i was like oh hey which what's the cat's name so he's like that one's dill and that one's doe and i just stopped and just looked at him we are are you serious like i, I thought he was joking and he's like no seriously it's it's dildo <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Could you could you imagine being a package delivery guy walking up to the door, dropping off some Amazon Prime, and the cats are fighting, and she's in there yelling at him, "Knock it off, dildo!" <laughs> <laughs> There's so many jokes that could be had. Oh my god! <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, we'll continue on. Enough of the personal story hour. I'm gonna have to make a sounder for the personal story hour, and I'll have to play that every time we tell a personal story. <laughs> <laughs> the lead up to that needs to be a train wreck because we go totally off the rails each time we start down that route. No kidding. We go from Flashlight Annie to Cat's Name Dildo. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> All right, continuing on. <laughs> so just to remind everybody, we were talking about Robert Redford and Ryan O'Neill pre- previously. Anyway, back on track. So they spent the night together, but he was unable to perform even over the next several days. This suggests that he was now only able to get sexual gratification after performing a heinous act. On November 10th, the pair parted ways, but Knowles picked up an acquaintance of Fox, Susie McKenzie. He demanded sex from her at gunpoint, but she was able to escape and reported him to police. Police attempted to apprehend him, but when approached, he brandished a sawed-off shotgun and was able to escape. A few days later, he invaded the home of invalid Beverly Maybe in West Palm Beach, Florida. He abducted her sister and stole their car. He then traveled to Fort Pierce, Florida, arriving the following night. He dropped off the hostage without issue. On November 17th, a Florida Highway Patrolman, Eugene Campbell, noticed a stolen car near Perry, Florida. When a patrolman attempted to arrest Knowles, he was able to wrestle Campbell's gun away from him and take him hostage. They got into the police cruiser and continued down the road, where Knowles used the police car to pull over James Meyer. He stole Meyer's car but now had two prisoners to deal with. Knowles took the prisoners off into the woods and handcuffed them together around a tree and proceeded to shoot both men in the head at close range. Knowles continued on without care as he tried to slam through a police barricade in Henry County, Georgia. He lost control of his car and smashed into a tree. He continued on foot, firing shots at pursuing officers. Knowles was chased by police, equipped with police dogs and helicopters. Finally, he was cornered by a civilian armed with a shotgun several miles from the search area. The man escorted Knowles to a neighbor's home where they called police. Once the police had Knowles in custody, he claimed responsibility for 35 murders. However, only 20 were corroborated. On December 18, 1974, Knowles was being escorted by Sheriff Earl Lee and Georgia Bureau of Investigation agent Ronnie Angel. They were on their way to Henry County, Georgia to locate the dumped handgun he had taken from the state trooper, Charles Campbell, whom he had murdered. As they were driving down the road, Knowles, handcuffed in the back seat, made a move for Lee's handgun, discharging it through the holster. Lee was driving and struggling to fight with Knowles simultaneously, while Agent Ronnie Angel fired three shots directly to Knowles' chest, killing him on the spot. Man, what a wild story. <laughs> like, when I read this, um, for the first time, a few weeks back, yeah, I never heard of this case. And this, this is what made me want to tell the story, was the ending here. Um, I mean, it sounds like straight out of a movie, you know, prisoners in the back seat goes for the gun. The cop driving, the other cop turns around and blasts him three times in the chest to take him out. You know, on top of the fact that Knowles was this spree killer and was all over the country just killing people randomly and somehow managed to escape for as long as he did. I mean, it, it was just incredible. That's exactly what it sounds like is to plot to a movie. And I mean, I equate this guy to like the Houdini of that time. He, he picked his locket at a jail cell. 
He gets out. He's plowing through police barricades. He's handcuffed in the back of a police car, but yet still can wrestle a gun away from a cop and, and fire it off in his holster while, while restrained. I mean, Jesus. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is this is literally the stuff that movies are made out of. Like, this whole story is just so unbelievable on so many levels. And it's like, you know, the fact that they go from, you know, he goes from killing, you know, that woman at the beginning where he strangles her, or well, he gags her and she dies, you know, to killing kids. And then he's, you know, all over the country doing this, stealing cars, stealing money, you know, seducing women, getting them to pay for him. It just like it's incredible the amount of things that he was doing it's it's a relatively short period of time you know it was what july that he escaped and did this until december <laughs> so you know he had like five months of this going on it's pretty crazy yeah do you think something like that could happen today where somebody could do that much stuff within five months i, I don't think so but i mean anything's possible too i guess i do i think so depending on the right strategy if you will like i mean there's been people who you know kill people and then hide up in the woods in a cabin somewhere you know and they have a hard time finding them they're in the mountains or whatever what was that story that happened not too long ago and didn't they end up lighting the cabin on fire to get the guy to come out or what am i thinking of i'm not sure what you're thinking of nothing that i recall off the top i feel like there's a story in the last five or ten years probably five years maybe, where somebody had killed a bunch of people and then took off into the mountains, and they were searching all through all these cabins and stuff, and they couldn't find anybody, and then finally they found him. I think they had to light the cabin on fire because he wouldn't come out. We'll have to look into that. The only thing that I can think of that's remotely close to that story, and I don't think it's the same story, was that guy in Pennsylvania that I think he had killed a couple of state police officers or whatever and then disappeared into the woods for I think it was like 40 or 50 days but I don't recall if they had to smoke them out that way yeah I I'll have to do some homework I don't, I don't recall yeah I, I don't remember the exact story and the exact way that it went down but it was pretty crazy I remember maybe, hey, maybe that's a legitimate question for Instagram throw that out there and see if one of our listeners can come back to us and tell us what the case is I, I don't recall. I don't need I don't need listeners. I have Google. It was Christopher Dorner. Yeah. He was an ex LAPD officer. Oh, okay. When that was, was on this? the West Coast then. That wasn't the Pennsylvania yeah. guy. It was five years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um yeah, it says that I'm just kind of reading the reading the story here, but um yeah. They burnt the he barricaded himself inside of a cabin. And uh, he engaged in gunfire with the cops. And then I think the cops burnt the building to try and smoke him out. But he just stayed in there and died. But yeah. Yeah, because I kind of remember that when this happened, it was like, it happened like at just the right time where like nobody was in this particular cabin area. Like they were all vacant or mostly vacant. So people weren't too worried because at first, you know, it was like, well, that's crazy. Like, you know, what a... You know, what's this guy up to? You know, like, is he going to try and, like, kidnap people or what's he doing? But, like, then he was in an area where it wasn't very populated in terms of the season they were in, if I remember correctly. But, yeah, it was was a crazy story. Yeah, because they manhunted him for several days. And then he carjacked somebody and then he took off and then he opened fire on some officers. And then, yeah... The, the police tried to get him out of a cabin using tear gas, and then when he didn't respond, they used a demolition vehicle to knock down most of the walls of the building, and then they shot pyrotechnic tear gas canisters into it, and then it caught fire, and uh, then they heard a single gunshot wound, a uh, single gunshot from the cabin, so he must have shot himself at the end. Yeah, that's a crazy story. We uh, probably should have told that one, too. <laughs> I spoiled it for you, but yeah, it was a... Uh, that was yeah, that was a wild story. I remember that because I was watching the news like daily as they were doing their manhunt for that. It was just I was fascinated by that story. Yeah, maybe we'll have to present that in a formal manner at some point. We we kind of did spoil yeah. it, but give it a while, we could come back to it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, once we hit episode like two hundred, we'll come back and talk about that one. You guys forget about it. Our listeners are too smart; they'll remember that. Maybe by the episode two hundred, they'll forget about us talking about cats that are named Dildo and. 
My, my inability <laughs> to, to decipher between uh, Robert Redford and Paul Newman because I because I'm an <laughs> idiot. <laughs> oh man, that makes for a great show, right? Today, today started off the rails. It was only fitting that the whole episode is off the rails. So, if you guys come here for your your true crime fix and uh, felt like we did you a disservice this week, I don't blame you. We probably did. Yeah, <laughs> I will apologize up front. Sorry for that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry for this week. It's an abomination of an episode. <laughs> well, well, I guess we should probably put the wrap on this thing. I think so. If you enjoyed our show. Please rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Unless you're going to rate us a one this week, don't don't rate us. Don't go out. <laughs> don't go out there. If you'd like to support us financially, you can head out to our website www.killerpod.net. You can click the support button at the top of the page or via the navigation menu. You can also hit up our Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com forward slash killer podcast. And don't forget, we can be found on all the normal social media platforms. We can be found at Twitter at killer underscore podcast. Instagram is at killer podcast. Facebook, facebook.com forward slash killer podcast. Or if you just want to shoot us a quick email, killer podcast at gmail.com. And I just want to say next week we'll be less off the rails and don't text and drive. Stay safe. <laughs>